Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm very honored to re receive this uh, prestigious award. Soon after I received the award letter, our dean told me, you are tenured. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the power of this award. <laughs> So I would like to thank the uh, committee and the staff for organizing this uh, wonderful annual meeting. I really enjoyed the previous talks in the past two days, and I really learned a lot. So today I would like to share with you some of our recent work for developmental nanomaterials, for mRNA-based therapeutics, and also our efforts on the regulation of CRISPR system. First, I would like to give you an overview about the research in my lab. We are focusing on the development of platform technologies which can be applied for diverse diseases. So the first platform is lipid, lipid-like or lipid-derived nanoparticles. We synthesize different types of lipid derivatives, then we can formulate them with other formulation components into self-assembled nanoparticles. Then we can use different therapeutic cargoes such as messenger RNA, SNA, or other type of the, uh, nuclear acid cargoes. The second platform we are working on is to engineer the CRISPR system. The goal is to improve the gene editing efficiency or regulate the function of the uh, CRISPR protein. The third platform we are working on is uh, antibody drug conjugates or ligand drug conjugates. We hope to deliver the drug into specific disease cells and achieve the therapeutic function. So today I would like to focus on the first and the second uh, uh, technology platforms and give you an overview about uh, our research. So now we all know like messenger RNA has become a promising class of drug and the first uh, RNA based drug has been approved and we hope the next uh, like messenger RNA will have some therapeutic products in the uh, clinic soon. We all know now for this audience delivery is one of the key challenges for its broad applications in human patients. I'll now go through the details. Based on our previous experience for delivery of small RNA, we are thinking to design new type of lipid derivatives, and we think a small compound here, it is composed of phenyl ring, three amide linkers, and multiple lipid chains. And through one step reaction, reductive amination, we can synthesize uh, these uh, TT lipids in large scale, and uh, we can tune the carbon length from two carbons to eight carbons or even long chains. And this slide gives you an uh, overall strategy how we develop and optimize the lipid like nanoparticles. The newly synthesized TT lipids were formulated with three hour formulation components. And here, the therapeutic cargo is messenger RNA. Through a micro base device, we can self-assemble them into very nice nanoparticles. Then we can characterize particle properties, such as size, zeta potential, mRNA entrapment uh, efficiency, and also the translation efficiency. Then we utilize the orthogonal experiment design, which is widely used in the field of chemical engineering we can efficiently identify the optimal formulation with significantly reduced uh, experiment number. And after that, we identify the optimal formulation, then we can test uh, in different uh, disease models. So I'll just uh, skip the details uh, for our optimization process and uh, give you some proof of concept uh, studies in animals. So first the disease model we select is uh, hemophilia. Hemophilia is a genetic disorder. It is caused by missing or mutation of factor eight or factor nine. Patients suffer from life-threatening bleeding or serious uh, complications such as uh, joint bleeds. So in this study, we formulated the TT3 with uh, mRNA encoding human factor nine. Then we can inject it uh, intravenously into the wild-type mice and uh, here also factor nine knockout mice. So the y-axis, that's the factor nine concentration in the serum access the different treatment groups. So we can see if in both wild-type mice and the factor IX knockout mice, it showed a dose-dependent recovery of the factor IX concentration in the serum. So next, we are wondering if these proteins are active or not. So we did a activity assay. So here's the y-axis, uh, it's MIU per ML, the uh, factor IX activity, X access uh, different treatment groups. It also showed those dependent recovery of the factor IX activity. 
In normal humans, the factor IX activity is between 500 to 1500 MIU per ml. At a dose of this 1.1 milligram per kilogram, the activity is around 800. So that means that this nanoparticle is able to fully recover the factor IX activity into the normal physiological range of the factor IX activity uh, uh, in this uh, uh, factor IX knockout mice. So next, we are wondering if we can utilize this system for other diseases. We selected uh, hepatitis B. Hepatitis B is a worldwide pandemic. It affects over 350 million patients. And uh, about 80% of patients, they have to take the antiviral drugs lifelong. However, this drug can only inhibit new viral infection. They cannot stop virus to produce viral proteins, which are the cause of the serious complications such as the liver cancer, liver cirrhosis, uh, or, or uh, other like uh, uh, complications. So we decided to learn from the nature. Everyone now know about the CRISPR system. It is a, a immune system for the bacterial. When virus invades bacterial, the bac uh, uh, bacterial triggers this uh, CRISPR system to counteract the viral infections. So the rationale here, here is if we can encapsulate the CRISPR system into our nanoparticles, then they deliver Cas9 and guide RNA into the infected cells. They identify the HBV DNA and then induce gene cutting. The HBV DNA undergoes uh, mutagenesis uh, or be degraded, then they are not functional anymore. So in this study, we tested all kinds of formulation ratios, and eventually we were able to load over 99% of the guide RNA and the Cas9 mRNA into that TD3 nanoparticles. So with the help of our collaborator, we established a HBV mouse model by hydrodynamic injection of plasmid encoding HBV, and then we injected nanoparticle with Cas9 mRNA and the guide RNA. So for one guide RNA SG21, we can see it showed a significant reduction for all the biomarkers of the HBV uh, uh, biomarkers, such as the serum S antigen, E antigen, liver S antigen, E antigen, HBV RNA, and also HBV DNA. So we are quite excited about the, the results, and uh, next we are thinking, okay, if we can make the nanomaterials more biodegradable. So we made some model compounds, and uh, using different uh, uh, lipid chains. So here is a, a linear ester chains, and also we designed branched uh, ester chains that can introduce uh, uh, steric effects. And here are, are two different controls, epoxide-derived uh, uh, lipid chains and also accurate-derived chains. So here I only show the biodegradability uh, studies and the uh, delivery of messenger RNA. You can have a look at the published paper. So in vitro, we can see these uh, nanoparticles uh, with a linear chain of the ester, and this is uh, branched, and this is non-degradable through the epoxide derivative. Here, there is uh, not much degradation, and uh, here is much slower degradation, and uh, here the degradation is much faster. So through this uh, very simple chemistry, we can tune the degradation of the nanoparticles uh, with our desired function. And we also did the in vivo studies. Very quick, the nanoparticles uh, is absorbed uh, to organs from the blood, not much in the blood after one hour. And uh, then we tested the concentration in the liver. These nanoparticles with uh, linear ester chain is quickly degraded. And the nanoparticles with branched chains, it showed a slow degradation, but it's still biodegradable. So based on our like a functional and our desired uh, disease, uh, then we can tune the biodegradability in the future. In the second part, I would like to switch gear to our regulation for the CRISPR system. CRISPR CPY also called uh, uh, Cas12A, it was uh, reported uh, by Feng Zhang at MIT in 2015. This uh, CPFY is functional through a single guide RNA, it recognizes a T rich PAM and they induce staggered uh, DNA double uh, breaks. And this uh, single guide RNA, it's an oligonucleotide, about uh, 43 lengths, so it's uh, perfect for us to do some chemical modifications. So these are some representative chemical modifications. Uh, all the audience know about this. 
So we introduced uh, all these uh, chemically modified uh, nucleotides into the guide RNA. On the left, that's a wild type of guide RNA. Then we can introduce the chemical modifications uh, for the full length or at a five prime end, three prime end, or only five uh, prime end, uh, or at the seed region, or only the three prime end. Then we did all the evaluation studies, and uh, then we selected the best one. And the next, uh, we use the same strategy to modify the uh, messenger RNA. And uh, we identify the best one due to the time limit. I'll just uh, go to the final slide uh, uh, for this study. So we combined the modified guide RNA and the modified uh, messenger RNA compared with the wild type guide RNA and the original plasmid encoding uh, ASCPF1. So you can see comparing the green bar and the red bar, it showed a consistent uh, increase of the gene editing efficiency. We tested the three different uh, gene losses. The results are consistent. And uh, we also tested uh, another CPF1 family protein, LBC CPF1. The increase is more profound, uh, profound. So using the original combination, there's no detectable gene editing. With this uh, modified uh, combination, it showed uh, over 40% uh, gene editing. And also, these are three different cell lines we tested. The results are quite consistent. To confirm the gene editing efficiency, we further did a uh, deep sequencing. So on the left, uh, the red bar, that's the on-target gene editing efficiency. You can see here the original combination, about 1%. And uh, with our chemically modified uh, guide RNA and the messenger RNA, it increased uh, about 66%. So it increased over threefold. And uh, for the top four predicted uh, off-target sites, and we didn't uh, see significant change of the off-target effects. So when we are working on the engineering of the uh, CRISPR-CPF1, we noticed that researchers reported anti-CRISPR proteins. They can serve potent inhibitors uh, for the Cas9 uh, uh, endonuclease. Then we are thinking maybe we can work on synthetic oligonucleotides and make them to inhibit uh, CPF1 uh, pro uh, activity. So here are some representative chemically modified uh, nucleotides. We can incorporate those uh, with the synthetic oligonucleotide. And here are some examples of synthetic DNA oligonucleotides. And we also prepared a synthetic RNA oligonucleotide. Then we tested their inhibition activity. And to make the story uh, short, so we identified a phosphor cell 8 modified DNA is potent uh, uh, CPF1 inhibitor. It showed time-dependent de inhibition and also dose-dependent inhibition. And we selected another two gene losses. The results are consistent. And at the different cell lines, uh, it showed a potent inhibition activity. And also for another uh, CPF1 family protein, LBCPF1, it also time-dependent uh, inhibition. We also did a lot of mechanism study. We want to know why this uh, PS-modified DNA is able to inhibit uh, the CPF1 activity. And uh, here is a, a proposed uh, mechanism. Normally, the guide RNA interact with CPF1 form this uh, two-component uh, complex. Then they identify the target DNA and uh, induce uh, gene cutting. With this uh, modified uh, PSDNA, it doesn't uh, block the uh, uh, guide RNA bind with the CPF1, but uh, it forms this three component uh, complex. It stops recognize uh, the, uh, this uh, target DNA. Then the process stops here, then it inhibits the CPF1 activity. So in conclusion, we first designed uh, some lipid-like or lipid-derived nanoparticles, and uh, it showed the efficient delivery of the messenger RNA. We can also tune the biodegradability of the nanoparticles. And we showed some proof of concept study in hemophilia and uh, hepatitis B treatment. And uh, in the second part, uh, we were able to increase the gene editing efficiency over threefold uh, using the chemically modified nucleotides. And uh, lastly, we identified the PS-modified uh, oligonucleotides serve as uh, potent uh, CPF1 inhibitor. So now we try to move the project forward, and uh, together with our collaborators, uh, we hope to integrate our specialty in the biomaterials, RNA engineering, genome editing, 
immunoengineering, and uh, cell therapy. Our optimal goal is to translate our technology into more effective treatment uh, for the human patients in the future. So with that, I would like to thank my lab members. This is a group of talented postdoc graduate students, undergrad students, and a few high school students. And thanks our collaborators for their significant contributions to different uh, projects. Thanks the funding agency support our uh, uh, projects. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Nice presentation. I was wondering if you could tell us how many uh, repeat dosings you've been able to do to sustain expression with your mRNAs, with your new particles. We haven't done for these particular nanoparticles. For the particles, previously I developed uh, uh, the company license, and they did that. Uh, it can do multiple injections, and uh, they plan to initiate a clinical trial uh, early next year. Congratulations. Thank you. In your uh, PS oligo, which blocks it, does it need to be a DNA, or it could be modified? Phosphorothiazide. Uh, prime modifications and all that. Yeah, so we tested all kinds of chemically modified uh, uh, nucleotides. Uh, PS DNA is the most important one, and uh, we also found uh, fluorine modified can also, two prime fluorine modified can also inhibit, but if, for the company, it's hard to make the full length two prime modified uh, nucleotides. We don't know like how potent the side, side comparison. <laughs>